Welcome to the Arnold Arboretum Tree Mob. I am Pam Thompson, Manager of Adult Education, and today's topic is catering to pollinators. It is in recognition of Pollinator Week. Our speaker is Colin McAllen Cook, Horticultural Technologist with the Arnold Arboretum, where he manages the oaks, hornbeam, mountain laurel, and corkwood collections. He's also responsible for managing some of the Arboretum's wilder naturalized landscapes, such as Bussy Brook, the Rockery, and the Meadow. Colin earned Bachelor of Science degrees in biology and in anthropology from Grinnell College, and a Master's of Science in Applied Geoscience with University of Pennsylvania. He's also a certified as a wildlands firefighter and is an avid lepidopterist. Colin has worked as a farmer, field researcher, and horticulturist. Before joining the crew at the Arnold Arboretum, he managed the Meadow Garden at Longwood Gardens from 2014 to 2018. His professional interests include invasive species control, environmental restoration, invertebrate conservation, and fire ecology. Welcome, Colin. Hi, everybody. Welcome. So uh, glad you could all join us here on this beautiful day. And thank you, Pam, for that lovely intro. So yeah, I, uh, let's, let's talk some pollinators. <laughs> um, this is a really good spot to do it. Um, we're actually standing right on the border of a place we call Kent Field along the banks of the Bussy Brook. Um, this is one of the areas that I do manage at the Arboretum uh, with a lot of help, to be sure. Um, and this is really one of our big hotspots for pollinators at the Arboretum. Um, now, to, just to start off, I'd like to recap kind of what the definition of a pollinator is, since this is a question that I probably get the most frequently. Um, and yeah, I can, I can hear some of you groaning from here, but don't worry, it'll, we'll get beyond. <laughs> um, so pollen, pollinators are essentially um, any animal that carries pollen from the male parts of a flower to the female parts of the flower for reproduction. Um, many flowering plants, um, but, not, but by no means all, depend on this um, for their means of reproduction. Um, probably, um, probably around, estimates are kind of, kind of sketchy depending on how you count it, but uh, when it comes to food crops that we depend on, um, upwards of 75% of our crops benefit from pollination and somewhere around 35% exclusively depend on the work of pollinators um, to produce the food and keep the plants around that we, we rely on. Um, but that number gets even larger when you're talking about plants in the general landscape. Um, within flowering plants, it's estimated that around 90% of them benefit from having pollinators around and a whopping 75% need them to survive. So that's, that's pretty substantial. Um, there's also a lot of wildlife that depends on pollinators as well. Um, they are um, food for many things, um, and that's because most of them are insects. Uh, now, not all pollinators are insects. Uh, you can have bats, mammals, uh, birds even. All kinds of different animals can serve that important role of transporting pollen. But we do tend to focus on insects, um, and that's going to be our main focus here today. Um, mostly because in Massachusetts, insect pollinators perform most of the work uh, of pollination, and also because they're the ones that frankly need our help the most right now. Um, insects, insects in general are having kind of a rough time globally, um, pollinators especially. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard this before. Um, now there isn't any organization or group of scientists out there that is specifically counting every single bee and every single butterfly. Um, so it's kind of hard to get a big picture of what's going on. Um, but the largest study and most comprehensive studies available suggest that we're losing um, around 9% of our total insects every decade. So that's, you know, a little less than 1% a year. Um, and that's globally. Uh, some areas, the losses are much heavier, others are much lighter. Um, but judging on a lot of insect surveys from the New England area, um, that's very much in the ballpark for what we're experiencing here. Um, so you, as you can imagine, uh, that's quite a big crisis. Um, what can you do about it? Fortunately, quite a bit. Um, the nice thing about pollinators is given that definition of a creature that transports pollen, 
that kind of necessitates two things. One is mobility, the other is size. Uh, there's only so large that our flowers get. So that really can play to your benefit, the benefit of the home gardener when it comes to designing habitat for pollinators. Uh, these things are generally small, uh, and if you build it, they'll come. Um, after all, they wouldn't be very good at faring pollen about the landscape if they couldn't find the flowers to begin with and weren't able to travel. Um, so with that in mind, I really would encourage anybody that's interested in getting into conserving pollinators um, to really not worry too much about the scope and scale of whatever projects they're envisioning. A windowsill garden, a backyard, um, an empty field, a lawn that maybe your kids have grown up and stopped having any use for, um, all of these things can really be turned into pollinator habitat. Um, so today I want to focus mostly on kind of the two different categories of things you can do. Um, the things you can stop doing and the things you can start doing. Seems kind of basic, but I always end up telling interns that start here, um, that that's really all gardening is to begin with, right? You know, you're taking things in and you're, you're putting things in, you're taking things out. Those things can be flowers, mulch, compost, uh, chemicals, fertilizer, you name it. And when it comes to pollinators and pollinator conservation, you got, got to remember that these guys are mostly doing most of the work. You're really somebody that is coming along to steward them and give them that little extra bit of help. Um, so I'd like to start off with the category of kind of passive measures. Uh, what can you start, what can you stop doing that's really going to help them? After all, probably the single best thing we can do for pollinators is stop, simply stop killing them. Um, now this isn't really to blame um, a lot of things that we do on the landscape end up negatively impacting insects and especially pollinators without even realizing it. Take, for example, mowing. So um, one thing that we started doing or stopped doing at the Arnold Arboretum several years ago was uh, mowing our landscape as intensively as we had done in the past. Um, we decided to set aside areas that were difficult to mow and frankly just a real big pain to mow, like Kent Field, which gets very wet in the springtime. Uh, these areas can serve as natural refuges for pollinators. Um, and really all that's required is just to have a, a different tolerance for what aesthetics you want. Now, I'm not saying that you need to dispense with your lawns entirely. Um, I'm well acquainted with homeowners associations and city governments and, and just frankly the need for open space in general. Um, but I really would encourage folks with any kind of lawn or backyard to take a look at it and think, which parts of this do I least enjoy mowing? Uh, <laughs> which times of year do I least enjoy mowing it? Because um, after all, you're, um, if you're mowing grass, a lot can depend on your timing. Kent Field, for example, um, our main objective here is to prevent the development of trees and that would ruin the lovely vista of the pinatum behind us. Um, but trees, uh, you know, you can mow them any time of the year, as long as you make sure that, they, that the saplings don't develop into large, um, you know, larger trees that are difficult to cut down. Um, why do that mowing in the summertime or the spring when pollinators are active and flowers are blooming? Um, when we do mowing of these no-mow areas, we try to do it in the dormant season. So we're able to meet those objectives of knocking back the woody plants with minimal disruption to pollinators. Um, now, technique is also rather important as well. Uh, we try not to mow everything in any given year. And I would really encourage um, anybody looking to make a meadow or pollinator friendly landscape to think about this. Um, pollinators don't just live during the summer. They live year round, um, and even though they're dormant, they're still on the landscape. Some of them go underground, but many of them actually overwinter right here inside stems and hollow twigs. And mowing operations, you know, they'll do a number on this sort of stuff. So it's always worthwhile to think about um, rotational mowing. If you were going to have an area that is dedicated to pollinators that maybe you're going to let get a little bit wild and a little bit shaggy, um, Maybe don't mow all of it every year. Um, rule, the rule of thirds is, is the commonly used um, mnemonic that you, know, you, you wanna have about a third of it cut any given year and you, ro and you rotate through an area. Um, I find that works pretty well, but honestly, whatever your needs are, um, 
less is more. Now, um, I'd like to show you some examples of the different natural materials that can be um, found in a landscape that is a little bit less intensively managed. Um, I will definitely get into some flowers, um, but I'd like to talk a, a little bit while we're at it of some natural materials that are really going to be of benefit to pollinators in the landscape. Um, hollow twigs, bits of bamboo, bits of wood, all of these things can be used by overwintering insects to nest and raise their young. And I would really encourage folks to uh, take a look around their home landscape and, and see what, what objects are there. Um, the, sometimes the cheapest forms of pollinator uh, benefit are things that are simply just uh, things you can stop doing. Um, do you wanna pick up all of your leaves? Well, sometimes it's can be really detrimental to grass, but um, in some areas where your grass isn't just growing very well to begin with, why not leave them there? Um, if you need to relocate brush or cut stems from last season's vegetation, um, you can put them out of sight without keeping them out of mind. What I like to do is if I have to clean dead vegetation from an area to make it more accessible, to help the plants grow in the following season, those materials don't necessarily have to be destroyed. You can just relocate them to somewhere that they're not an eyesore. Uh, the pollinators will find them and bees that will nest in the small cavities of stems, uh, butterflies that need a place for their pupa to overwinter, um, they'll be able to find those materials and make use of them. So coming to terms with kind of a, a little bit messier landscape is really in my opinion, a way of ma to make your landscape more structurally diverse. And structurally diverse landscapes are able to accommodate the ranges of much more, um, number, much larger numbers of different species. Um, but you guys are here for plants, so let's get a little bit more into that. So when it comes to mowing and landscape maintenance, learning to tolerate some of the things that we've taught ourselves to dislike over the years um, has really taken a toll on pollinators. Take flowering plants um, that, that appear in our lawns that are frequently regarded as weeds. Um, uh, Pam, do you have that photo I sent of the mm -hmm. violets? Um, yeah, so uh, that was a picture taken right outside the Honeywell building. Um, who here is, has had violets in your lawn or dandelions or uh, clover and you've just been, you know, driving yourself crazy thinking about how you can get rid of that stuff. Well, if you're looking for a nice green, you know, baseball field type lawn, yeah, you might want that to get rid of that stuff. But frankly, pollinators use it all. Um, if there's nothing else around, absolutely they'll make use of dandelions. Uh, violets are ex incredibly important food resources in the spring. And clover during the summer is just absolutely covered in bees. Um, you know, I, I kind of like the idea of a lawn that has a little bit more visual interest than just green. Um, and I'm not trying to ridicule folks that do like a nice big green lawn. I like that too. But if you really want to maximize your benefit to pollinators, maybe think about mowing your lawn, you know, maybe one time less a month. Um, maybe don't mow it weekly, maybe mow it once a month, twice a month. Um, whatever your, whatever your, uh, your neighbors will let you get away with. <laughs> um, and, you know, maybe think about setting the deck of that mower just a couple inches higher. Um, an inch or two is all that's necessary to allow a lot of these flowering clovers and violets and other plant species to survive that pollinators will be able to use. Uh, another recommendation I would really um, like to suggest while we're on that topic is delineation. All of these things that I'm talking about are, um, I don't want to say controversial, but they kind of are in cir some circles. Um, you know, uh, folks, folks really like to have neat, clean landscapes. And I, I very much get that. That has been kind of the, the byword in landscape management for the last 50, 60 years. Um, and in many cases, there's, there's laws and ordinances that determine what you can do with your home landscape and how, how messy it can be. Um, if you ever find yourself running up against those sort of obstacles, um, folks that think that you're um, your measures are just laziness, throw a little bit of intentionality in the mix. Um, what we do with our NOMO areas at the Arboretum, for example, 
is we make sure that the edges and borders are neatly trimmed so that it doesn't look like we just forgot to mow it um, by, by using a mower to create interesting shapes and paths through an unmowed section. Suddenly it becomes intentional and people stop looking at it as laziness and start looking at it as, as huh, I wonder what their goal was here. They start thinking about why you might have done something as opposed to why you might not have done it. Uh, general terms I know, but I find it goes a long way when trying to uh, convince people to get behind your efforts. Uh, so what are some of the things that, um, so what are some of the things that you can do? So we, we've talked a lot about things to stop doing. Um, and you know, pick those things as you will. But uh, for those really looking to get out and, and active in the world of pollinator conservation, um, I really would urge you to start with plants. Plants are the foundation of it all. Um, in terms of organic debris and material that can be used for nesting, the, uh, you know, the bamboo, the, the, the hollow stems, the wood, you can import those things if your home landscape is especially barren. I lived in a city apartment for many years and my window, you know, there was, there was no wood to be had. Um, but I don't necessarily think that you need to import these objects to give pollinators places to live. Um, I would start with the plants. After all, anybody, any gardener knows that uh, plants generate their own mess pretty quickly. Leaves, twigs, stems, all that organic debris that creates habitat, you'll be overflowing with that once you start planting. So don't worry about importing material that might come with some hitchhiking pests along with it. Focus on the plants and worry about that later. Speaking of plants, let's check out some of them. So milkweed is, has become a poacher child for pollinator conservation uh, and justifiably so over the last couple of years, given that it's, it's role for uh, monarch butterflies. Um, the, uh, the real wonder of milkweed is that it not only provides um, nectar when they're in bloom for butterflies and bees and all kinds of other pollinators, um, but uh, the leaves are actually uh, required for monarch caterpillar development. Uh, this has been a pretty widely known thing now, which I think is great. Um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, that, that would have surprised a lot of people. So we've come a long way in trying to get out the knowledge that uh, insects and pollinators specifically um, often have very specific plants that they need to complete their life cycle. This is true. Um, but specifically when it comes to pollinators, um, there's really, there's a couple different things that are af that they're after as far as the plants go that kind of play a role in this. The first is the nectar. Uh, the nectar is generally what is the, generally the attractant. You know, it's sugary, it's sweet, but chemically there's not actually a whole lot going on. Um, most flower nectar is chemically fairly similar, um, which is why you can fill up a hummingbird feeder with just sugar water and hummingbirds will happily feed on it. You can do the same thing with butterflies actually. I've fed them with sponges before, soaked in sugar water. But um, most of our pollinators, you know, their nectar needs can be met by almost anything with sufficient quantities of nectar. Um, pollen is a different story. Bees um, and wasps are often not necessarily visiting the flowers for the nectar, but they're actually after the pollen as well. Um, transferring it between the different flowers and performing that pollination role is more of kind of a happy accident. Uh, they will actually uh, feed the pollen to their young since it's very rich in protein and, and provides a kind of a tasty meal. Um, but pollen being protein is much more chemically complex than nectar. Therefore, the pollen of different species of plants varies tremendously. Um, many of our insect pollinators that gather pollen specifically um, are pollen specialists. Some like honeybees, for example, will take just about any type of, or I should say uh, European honeybees. They'll take just about any species of pollen that they can get. Um, but other species um, can be very, very specific in their requirements and are unable to digest other types of pollen. Um, I don't know the numbers offhand, um, but a shockingly large number of our native bees are pollen specialists. Um, so when it comes to planting flowers for pollinators, um, it's definitely worth looking around your home landscape and thinking about um, who, you really, who you really want to attract. 
Do you want to have more butterflies? Do you want to have more bees? Do you want to have more beetles? If you're looking for butterflies, think nectar, because they're really not after pollen much at all. Um, ah, yes, there it is. Just a second. One nice thing about butterflies is that they have very narrow, um, flowers that are very narrow are easily accessible to them because they have those long unfurling proboscises. So um, you can, a lot, lots of narrow bell-shaped flowers um, can be very, very useful to butterflies and moths as well. Um, bees, for example, they're able to force their way into some pretty tight flowers. Um, long, long, narrow, it doesn't necessarily matter because there's so many different types of bees that they can um, specialize in all different shapes of flowers. Um, but generally speaking, they're pretty capable. Uh, beetles are another large uh, group of insect pollinators, and they're a little, little more specialized. Um, they're kind of clumsy. Um, they, if anyone's ever seen a beetle in flight, it's not the most graceful thing. Uh, they tend to favor kind of wide open cup-shaped flowers uh, where there's a nice easy point of entry. Um, so it's definitely worth thinking about what, what uh, insect groups you're looking to cater to. Um, and you definitely want to plant things that are both appealing to specialists and generalists. Um, I, get, I often get a question about you know, what's, what's the best plant I should plant for pollinators? Which is a really good question. Uh, and frustratingly, um, there's an infinitely long list of answers that can be given to that. <laughs> um, I would say, I, I can't tell you what the best plant is, but I can tell you what the worst plant is. The worst plant for pollinators is a dead plant. So whatever you decide to plant, uh, think first and foremost about whether it's actually going to live. Um, Look, going online and looking up information about pollen specialist bees and rare butterflies that might be in your area that you could help conserve, that's an excellent destination. Go for it. But before you get carried away, think really, really hard about your, your home landscape or your windowsill or your porch or your lawn and think, what, what, am, what is it missing and what what can I bring to this landscape that will not only survive, but do the most good? Um, if you're a renter, if you are living in a place that you don't think you're gonna be very long, uh, maybe think annuals. If you just bought a house, if you are lucky enough to, to own some land, think about planting some flowering trees or shrubs. They're gonna be around for a while. Um, you know, it's always sad to, to move out of an apartment and wonder what's gonna to happen to all those lovely plants you planted in the backyard. Um, something I think about all the time. But, uh, you know, and, and if you don't have much room at all, if you have even a window, that can do good. Um, there's plenty of things that you can plant that, um, particularly annuals, that they may not appeal too much to rare specialist pollinators that you're probably not likely to find in the city anyway, um, but you absolutely will be catering to whoever's in your neighborhood. Um, and, uh, you know, if you build it, they will come. So I always like I always like to think about that. Um, let's see. Yeah. So um, another interesting thing about pollinator management, um, and specifically along as as far as plants go. And uh, Steve, if, if you're ready to pick up and move, I'd like yeah. to check out a couple more things down the way. Sure. How far down are we gonna go? So we're gonna go to those sambucas right oh, over yeah. there. All right. Sound I good? Can, I think I can. Nice. Um, yeah, so as we're, uh, how are we doing on time, Pam? I know we probably have a lot of burning questions coming up. Um, it's about 2.30 or so, almost 2.30, so you're, okay. you're well into it. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> a few more minutes, and we can Great. open it to questions. Um, yeah, so, and this, this is, uh, this, this, this is very much related to spacing. So, uh, so the Arnold Arboretum is very uh, woody plant focused, deservedly so. And I'm kind of biased because as a former, metal, former, former, former meadow manager, um, I, I definitely have an eye for herbaceous plants. But um, what's really interesting with certain woody plant species, particularly shrubs, is 
you don't necessarily need to be limited by space if you don't want to. This elderberry here is quite big, but you would be surprised to know that I cut this to the grounds not two years ago. Uh, this plant has probably been growing in this location for, gosh, years and years to get this size. Um, and once it, once it has a large enough root system developed, you can essentially coppice it. Now, I don't want this plant to get much larger than it is. I'll probably cut it down at the next available opportunity. Um, but in the meantime, look at all this beautiful bloom that we have here that's providing all these uh, pollen and nectar sources to flowers. Now, umbiliferous flowers like this that have lots of tiny little, little flowers on them, um, these are tend to be very useful to small solitary bees and small wasps. Um, when it comes to kind of thinking about which flowers might be appealing to which pollinators, um, use your head. You're probably not wrong in your assumptions in terms of size and shape. Uh, color is a question I hear a lot as well. Does, the co does color matter? Um, I would say it does. Um, a diversity of color is good. Um, there hasn't been nearly enough study into which colors specifically are most attractive, uh, but it always surprises people to learn that uh, bees can't see red for the most part. Um, so, you know, there definitely are major taxonomical differences when it comes to color perception um, that it's worth thinking about. Uh, but just, just as with form, um, variety is the most important thing you can do. Um, plant lots of different things um, and plant lots of things that are blooming throughout the year. Um, pollinators, you know, they, they don't just vanish into thin air when, they're, uh, when you don't see them. They, they live year round, even in dormancy. Um, and to have a really diverse, vibrant landscape, you wanna try and have as long a bloom period as you can. Things that bloom in the spring and the summer and the fall, this can be pretty tough to do, but the more coverage you have with flowers, the more you're gonna have resources available for different organisms, different times of year. Uh, so with that, I'm, I think I'm probably getting a little long in the tooth in terms of time. Um, mm -hmm. Let's, uh, let's move yeah. on to some questions. Okay, do you want, and hopefully first, some would, you, would you like me to show the other three pictures? Do oh, yeah. Um, about those? I'll do that yep, quickly. Absolutely. Okay, so this is the um, wasp. potter wasp nest. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, I, I apologize. We're, it's, it's, uh, for those wondering where all the pollinators are, this happens every time I go out in the landscape. Uh, you can never count on them. Uh, in this, in this case right now, you got a lot of wind and some moving clouds. Um, passing clouds are really not great for butterflies. They tend to dive for cover when they think it's a bird. Um, but at any rate, we got some photos. So uh, that potter wasp is a good example. Uh, that nest is just a couple centimeters long, very, very small. Um, and I found it in the Zenobia patch just down by Bussy Brook. Um, so there's a lot of things to think about that requires that potter wasp that, that, that potter wasp requires. Um, they, need, they need food, both for themselves and as adults and also for their young. So they'll eat pollen, they will drink nectar, but they also hunt other insects and they feed their young with other insects. Uh, they need mud nearby to build their nests out of, and then they need cover to, to put those small little nests so that they can survive the winter. If you think about it, that's kind of a lot of ingredients that need to go right in order to get potter wasps. Um, so when kind of thinking about what you can do to help pollinators, um, really try and think of the kind of big year round picture um, and think about their needs, not only in terms of food and flowers, but also shelter, places to hide, places to nest, places to not be eaten, uh, places to, to find a mate. Um, flowers are good for that, fortunately. It's a really good place of congregation. Um, but you know, little patches of mud, little pools of water, um, all those things can be very, very useful on a landscape and are in many cases required for the life cycle of these things. Um, All right. Let's see. Next picture is ah. um, a bumblebee. No, it is a. <laughs> oh yes, excellent. So, um, so what we have there is um, so that's a stand of Monarda fistulosa, and there's a hummingbird, uh, clearwing moth, and mm -hmm. a, a species of bumblebee that are both feeding off of it. So that's a great um, example of kind of flower form. 
Monarda has a very kind of narrow throat on the purple flowers. And hummingbird moths with a long coiled proboscis are perfectly able to reach down the throat of that flower and get that nectar. However, they're so well adapted that they barely pollinate those flowers at all because as you can see, um, that moth is barely touching the flower at all. It's not gonna get very covered in pollen. Bees on the other hand, uh, they're strong. They just force their ways right in. They pry open the flower tube and they crawl in there and they get covered in pollen. That's one of the things that makes them very effective pollinators. Uh, they kind of, they get down and dirty um, in terms of, you know, how to get at the pollen and they usually get covered as a result. Uh, bee bee hair, uh, bodies are actually covered in hair that are electrostatically charged to attract pollen. Uh, so that further helps them get really covered when they get in there. So uh, another thing to think about with that picture as well is, you know, Monarda is a, is a very vigorous, large clump forming plant and it looks absolutely magnificent when it's in flower but it really only blooms for a couple weeks out of the year so if that's all you plant um, that hawk that a uh, hummingbird moth and that bumblebee are going to be in trouble once it goes out of bloom I can't tell you how many fields of Monarda I've seen planted in in parking lots and uh, you know habitat areas where there's nothing else around to provide food once it stops blooming it's a good start but think beyond all right, there's one more picture. It is a bee on the oh, um, yes. Clintonia. Yeah, that's a good one. So that is a um, that is a spring beauty minor bee. That is a good example of a, an extreme pollen specialist. Spring beauties are ephemeral wildflowers that are only open for the barest time in spring. And that bee is only able to really feed and complete its life cycle on the pollen of spring beauties. There's dozens of different types of bees all over the country and other insects as well that are similar, similarly extreme specialists when it comes to their host plants. Um, it's a, definitely something to th think about, but don't let it overwhelm you when it comes to choosing flowers. Um, you know, you can, you can plant all the spring beauties you like for the spring beauty mining bee, but if it, they, you know, if none of them happen to be in your area, you're going to have, it's, it's not going to be as much of a benefit. Um, but it's always worthwhile thinking about the specialists and the generalists as well. All right, let's hit up some questions here. So sure. um, somebody has some milkweed available, plenty to share, but um, they're wondering when's the best time to transplant it. That's a very good question. Um, early as you can or uh it's definitely too late this time of year but um what i found with milk root weed is has very vigorous tap roots that do not like disturbance um, i've had very little luck transplanting milkweed in fact i've never been able to do it um, when you buy milkweed from a store or a garden center smaller the better when you're buying those bigger plants, the tap roots have already developed and in many cases started to coil around themselves in the pot. Um, they really suffer if they go too long without planting. Now that's not to, you know, no reason to despair. Um, if you have them in pots, um, might as well, you know, you might as well try. But if you're starting from scratch, earlier is better. Um, and direct application of seed is, is the best. Um, seed them where you want them. You know, if you have to grow them in pots or, or plug containers, you can do it, but know that it's gonna be a real uphill battle transplanting them. And if it's an established mature plant, don't even bother. Um, you'll try and dig it up, it might work. It's probably not. All right, um, are cultivated variations of plants less beneficial than the species? Oh, that's a very good question. It's a hotly debated issue, correct? <laughs> That's an area of, uh, of active research. Um, I know Mount Cuba Center in Delaware has been doing a lot of interesting work on that. Um, and uh, the results are actually kind of mixed. Um, it turns out that pollinators are pretty adaptable and uh, they're, they're able to accommodate a much wider variety of cultivars than was, initial, than was initially thought. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that they've definitely pinpointed some varieties that are really not advantageous, particularly double flowered varieties. If you have a, a variety of plant that is bred 
to have all of its um, basically like, you know, instead of a, when you have a compound flower that has ray and disc flowers, if they're all ray flowers, those are not the ones that really produce nectar. I think I have that right. I always get that switched. Um, at any rate, avoid double flowered varieties. Um, many of those are just so dense and have so little nectar that there's not much of value there. Uh, the other thing I would avoid is any variety that, that blooms like drastically outside of its normal time. Um, when it comes to choosing flowers, it's really, planting native is a really, really good idea. Um, and as native, you can, and, and right down to the varieties, because um, the life cycles of these insects are very, very closely tied with the life cycles of these, their plants. And when you've bred a plant to deviate from that, it might bloom at a time that it's that the insect has already emerged or maybe emerged to, uh, or hasn't emerged yet. And when you have a mismatch between the bloom time and the emergence time of a specialist insect, that could be an absolute disaster. If you're planting for generalists, it doesn't matter. But if you're planting something like milkweed that you really want to attract a specific insect like a, the monarch, you really want to think about whether it has been bred to bloom at a different time. Tropical milkweed that stays bloom, blooming well into the fall is kind of a death trap in that regard because it encourages the monarchs to stick around much longer than they normally would and they usually end up getting whacked by the frost. Great, Great question. Info. Why do some flowers such as St. John's wort seem much more attractive to honeybees than others such as marigolds, daylilies, etc.? Mm. Yeah, another Is that question. shape? Uh, it could be shape. It's, it's most likely um, smell or color. Bees in particular, are, as, when it comes to shape, are really adaptable. Um, in many cases, like, if they can't work their way into a flower, they'll chew their way in. Um, uh, but, they're, but they're very visual. Um, flower color is extremely important to bees um, in ways that we really, quite frankly, don't understand well, because bees don't see color in the same way that we see it. Uh, they see whole parts of the spectrum that are invisible to us. Um, and uh, researchers have been trying to unpack that, those relationships for a long time. And it's, uh, the more research is done, the, the more complicated the picture gets. But my guess is that what the bees are cluing into would either be like some kind of floral scent, but more likely the, the colors. And um, in some cases, invisible patterns that are present on the flowers that they can see that we can't. Um, in some situations, they've been able to mimic kind of bee vision um, with use of like ultraviolet cameras. And uh, there's all types of patterns that are on, on flowers that are invisible to us that are, are visual signals to bees. Which specifically about marigolds, I couldn't tell you, but I would guess there's something, something up with that. <laughs> all right. Um, do we know how much of a positive impact it makes to plant pollinator friendly plants in dense urban areas? Man, boy, I wish we could quantify that. Um, there's a lot of work going into that and it's, it's, it's going very slow. Um, especially when you, when you think about urban areas, um, you have to balance the benefit of catering to the insects that are there and the, the potential detriment of luring in insects that, to an area that they might die. Um, in, in ecology, we call this sources and sinks. For example, with Kent Field, um, if we were to plant all these flowers and then abruptly mow it, we've created a sink. We're drawing them in just to be murdered, basically. And, uh, you know, it's, it's worth thinking about whether our pollinator gardens, wherever they're located, are serving as that. Um, one researcher I worked with, um, uh, Doug Talame, actually, who was attempting to figure that out at one point, was basically having his grad students pick up dead bees off of a road to attempt to figure out, like, whether, um, like, roadside and parking lot pollinator gardens were actually doing good or whether the bees were coming in and getting hit by the cars. And... Uh, I never did find out whether or not they were able to collect data. It's something that's very, very hard to assess because insects are just hard to count in general. Um, but I definitely can say that, um, you know, I, I think it's worth going for. Um, 
if you have, you know, it's not like our urban areas are devoid of insects. They are there. And in my opinion, if they're there now, they've probably survived worse than what we're throwing at them right now. Uh, I certainly think it's worth trying, uh, but the science isn't quite there yet. All right. Um, how best can we provide water to pollinators? Uh, in many cases, um, they can get all, their, all they need from flower nectar. Um, but that's not entirely always the case. Honeybees, for example, are very dependent on water sources, and you'll see them lapping it up at streams and puddles. Um, butterflies as well um, will aggregate on muddy puddles and patches um, where they not only are drinking water, but also sucking up essential nutrients that are contained in the mud. Now, I definitely don't suggest making like a pollinator bird bath. The reason for that is because you're going to forget about it, and then it's going to breed mosquitoes, uh, you know, which they're bird food, but I'm not sure that we really want a whole lot of that. So I would suggest that if you want to um, provide water resources for pollinators, think less about water and more about mud. Um, a lot of insects have no problem absorbing moisture from mud. Um, flies can do it, bees can do it, butterflies can definitely do it. Um, and mosquitoes cannot breed in mud. They need standing water. So uh, that's, always a good, that's always a good angle if you're interested in that. But generally right. speaking, they get most of what they need from the flowers. That's great. Um, I'm gonna take just a few more questions. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the native milkweeds for the area? And someone Absolutely. wanted to know where to get them, but I think you can go to local nurseries and request well, them or... Um, yeah, as far as sourcing, I'm, I'm a newcomer to Massachusetts, so I'm still mm -hmm. learning my way around the various nurseries and, uh, and uh, garden centers. But in terms yeah. of species, uh, the big three that we have are swamp milkweed, which likes wet, sunny areas, common milkweed, which likes kind of like, uh, not dry, but kind of like average moisture areas and full sun, and then butterfly milkweed, which likes dry areas and full sun. Um, of the three, I find that common milkweed is definitely the most adaptable, um, and that even swamp milkweed despite its name, can survive fairly well in your average garden. One, one quickie question. Um, sure. um, do you have a favorite pollinator? Oh, yeah. Uh, my favorite's the hummingbird moth, um, Hamaris thisbe. I, I always have to put that in there. They're just so cute. Um, they, um, so hummingbirds themselves are, are pollinators around here, particularly the ruby-throated hummingbird. And that's the only species that we have in eastern North America. Uh, the hummingbird moth is a hummingbird mimic, and it mimics the ruby-throated hummingbird so well that it even has fake tail feathers on it. Um, it's kind of incredible to think about it, because most insect mimics will um, they'll only mimic the appearance, and they'll try and save energy by, like, by not doing the whole charade. So, you'll, so something will dress up like a bee, but it won't sting, because it doesn't need to. But hummingbird moths have decided, not only are we going to look like hummingbirds, but we're going to act like hummingbirds and fly like hummingbirds, and we're going to do it all, which is just astounding to think about. They're also just really cute. Okay, and then, because I really don't know the answer to this question at all, now, or which way the, the questioner wants you to answer. So, um, does how much you water a lawn make any difference to pollinators? Um, I assume um, like the mud. <laughs> not as far as I know. It should be should be good. Though I will say that a, um, you know, lawn grass definitely lawn grass doesn't benefit from dry conditions, right? So you know you irrigate your lawn to get better grass. Uh, I would say if you want to have more things that aren't grass in your lawn that might be more useful to pollinators, try to try to under irrigate. So I would say like a dry lawn. Is going to have less grass and more other things. So actually, yeah, that, that might indirectly be a pretty good answer. <laughs> so it's less about helping the pollinators and more about like killing what's not useful to them. Uh, I don't always advocate for killing grass, but sometimes you can just let it die. All right. I think we're going to shut it down there, Colin. Thank you so much. No um, Thank you guys. Terrific information and 
um, just to tie up a few things. Um, Kent Field is in the Arboretum and it is the low area just below the Pinetum. Um, if you're trying to get to this location right off of um, Hemlock Hill Road. And um, please join us again for another tree mob. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Steve. Oh, thank you.